Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what is category theory. Today I would like to talk about strictification, which is kind of one of the most important um, theorems, if you want, or concepts about monoidal categories. So the whole point about monoidal categories was they were really, really cool. And um, they have a two-dimensional calculus. I'm going to more into details in a later video. Um, and they kind of generalize cross products or tensor products in uh, vector spaces. It's a very general concept, pretty really cool and rich your cal uh, calculus. But they are slightly tricky because they're a little bit tricky to define. Not really um, kind of the definition of the categorification of a monoid. And there's a certain a lot of commutative diagrams that you need to draw and need to check. And that's a little bit painful. And strictification kind of gets rid of all of that and actually says that the definition isn't all that bad. Um, there's an alternative name, which I should coin here, which I'm not going too much into details. So the strictification theorem I'm going to explain is actually equivalent to what people call the monoidal coherence theorem or MacLean's coherent theorem. They're not the same theorems, they're just equivalent. So you can use one of them to show the other. Um, I'm, I'm mostly staying with the strictification because it's kind of easier to remember and also easier to explain. But in case you've heard about MacLean's coherence theorem, I'm showing you, as I said, an equivalent uh, way of describing it, an equivalent theorem. So here's a question. And the question is actually, actually doesn't have anything to do with monoidal categories. It's really just for, well, your first class on maybe linear algebra, maybe you somewhere else, basic set theory or whatever, you will meet the definition of a group or something like that, a monoid, whatever you want. For category theory speaking, it's probably more what you want to look at is more and more of a monoid. But if you like groups more, then you can think of group. And the definition of a group usually involves some associativity condition, like this one here. So HGF equals HGF, which is with two different bracketings. And this is kind of what I would like to call the wrong definition of a group, whatever wrong means, of course. And the correct definition would be actually associativity should be all bracketings are the same. Yeah, this is just well, keep this is really crucial difference, right? Here I'm just assuming that a certain bracketing just involving three symbols is, a, is they're just the same, the two ways of bracketing three symbols. But actually, that's kind of what I'm trying to sell here. The correct definition should be that all bracketings, all ways of uh, using parentheses gives the same result. That should be associativity, right? That's, that should be the definition of a associativity of a group. Um, obviously, B is way more painful to check because you would need to check infinitely many bracketings. So what you really want, so kind of the philosophically correct way of doing it would be to use B as a definition and then show that A is actually equivalent to B. That's what you should do. Uh, in most classes on group theory or whatever, when you see that, it's actually not done or rings or whatever. You usually only see A because it's kind of well known that A and B are equivalent. But kind of philosophically speaking, that's a wrong way of doing it. The correct definition, I said again, whatever correct means, of course, the correct definition should be B and A should be kind of the equivalent, the theorem A is equivalent to B. And then you don't worry about B anymore, you only check A. That's kind of the point. And yeah, so the wrong definition, if you want, in pictures is just the small one, right? So just the same, just in pictures. And the correct definition is that kind of all ways of doing this. It gives the same result, right? It kind of makes sense. It kind of makes sense for everything. It's kind of not really related to monoidal categories. It's just a kind of a way to think about associativity. If you want. And indeed, this is not so easy in general to prove. Well, as I said, for, for groups or something like one dimensional objects, this is a one dimensional calculus for sticking numbers together. This is kind of well known that um, A and B are kind of equivalent. And but as you can see, it's a little bit tricky. So this would be uh, all bracketings of four symbols, right? You only assume the one for three symbols, but here are all four symbols. And as you can see, so in each step here on my graph, I do just one little operation of the point here, I just do one of these operations. And if I do one of these operations, this graph is connected. So this, this is just showing that if I know associativity for three symbols, then I get associativity for four symbols. And this proof actually easily generalizes. So in the next step, you would draw a similar graph with more terms, it gets bigger, and you can do some inductive argument if you want uh, to be really, really picky here to prove that, right? And what I would like to call a coherent theorem is exactly that A and B are equivalent. That's kind of 
the coherence theorem. Obviously, B, the all bracketings commute, uh, all bracketings are the same, implies A. That's kind of the easy part. And the coherence, if you want, is A implies B. Like the proof here, kind of the pictorial proof I have here at the top of my slide. That A implies B. And then as soon as you know that, you just forget all bracketings anyway, because they're all the same. And that's what I would call a strictification. And yes, we do that all in practice. Almost no one writes brackets anymore, uh, at least for multiplication for groups or so. You just forget about them. That's strictification. And the point is, well, if you can do this for a one-dimensional calculus, you should be able to do that for two-dimensional calculus, like monoidal categories. So let's actually have a look on how that should work. So um, you might wonder, why do we need parentheses in the first place? It's kind of this technical issue. Why can't we get rid of them altogether and just don't worry about them? Well, let's have a look at our favorite category. No, not quite. My favorite category is category of vector spaces, but maybe this one is a little bit easier. Uh, in vector spaces, you would need to write down the tensor product, which is not really hard, but um, a cross product is certainly easier to think about in a tensor product. Anyway, it was a lot of waffle. So here I have my category of sets, and I would like to think about this, these two objects, and they're obviously isomorphic, right? So X, X, Y, and Z are some sets, whatever, whatever they are. You can think of them as being whatever kind of set you kind of set you like. Maybe you want to exclude the empty set, but anyway, um, um, it doesn't really matter. So they are isomorphic as objects. Um, and the isomorphism is just the associativity rebracketing, but they're not the same, right? They're not equal as sets. Set theory is really, really unflexible. So an object here would be a tuple of an element X and a tuple of an element X, uh, Y, Z. So that would be an object, uh, an element, sorry. I'm too much doing too much category theory. Would be an element here and an element here would look very, very similar, but it would be an X, Y pair and a Z pair which is not the same element, right? Obviously they are related by an isomorphism, by an identification, but they're not the same element. So indeed, to just make set kind of our basic example with this a monoidal category, we actually do need parentheses because things are thus not equal, they're just isomorphic. And all of these huge commuting diagrams and the definition of a monoidal categories ensure that you can kind of paste together all the relevant isomorphisms in a, in a coherent way. Coherent, again, coherent, huh? coherence theorem. It's different coherent than the coherence theorem in some sense. And in some sense, it's the same. Anyway, it was again a waffle. Um, and the kind of the point here is we're doing category theory. So although there's this flaw coming from set theory being really, really inflexible, and these two things that are obviously the same are not really the same because we are really, really picky what equality means. In category theory, you can even just place, replace set by an equivalent category, whatever, and then, then they actually we can force those to be the same. And that's kind of the flexibility of category theory. And that's kind of the strictification that happens here. Okay, so a strict monoidal category it has a really, really simple definition. It really is just a categorification of a monoid in contrast to, well, the, the monoidal category is whatever you want to call it, the genuine monoidal category is still um, a categorification of monoid, but it's not as easy defined as this one here. So a strict category, a strict monoidal category just has three inputs, obviously a category, obviously a tensor product, maybe I shouldn't say obviously, uh, a category, a tensor product, a monoidal product and a unit such that associativity holds and unitality holds, or identity law, whatever you want to call it. And it's a very, very simple definition, much, much simpler than the one using uh, the various pentagon identities and triangle identities or whatever in the original definition or in the usual definition of a monoidal category. And the theorem, which is called the strictification theorem, I said it's equivalent to the coherence theorem of McLean, is that every mon monoidal category can be actually replaced by a strict monoidal category. This is just saying, well, in, in formal words, it's it's monoidally equivalent. So it, there's an equivalence that preserves the monoidal structure. And this is really just saying you can forget about parentheses. Who cares about parentheses? Really cool theorem that tells you who cares about parentheses. And the proof is really, really cute. I'm not, I don't have time to explain it, but it's really, really cute. And, and basically, um, at least for the coherence theorem, is a higher dimensional version of this uh, uh, argument that just, you just locally use a certain type of moves and you create, a, in this case, a connected graph. It's a very nice 
uh, argument in general. There's a different argument which I'm going to explain, uh, which is less geometric in nature, um, but still still pretty cool to remember. Okay, so this is strictification. So kind of if you want every monoidal category is strict, let's forget about non-strict monoidal categories. So let me give you some examples. Here's some list of, list of examples. So um, my category is set. So what could be the strictification of set is actually the skeleton. The skeleton is a category equivalent to set where you identify um, isomorphic objects. So you identify those beasts here. Um, so there's the same in the skeleton and the skeleton just inherits uh, the, the structure of a numeral category and it's equivalent. So it's actually the strictification. Same for cut, same for vector spaces and so on. Um, not saying the strictification is always a skeleton. They are funny counterexamples. Careful, strictifying just gives you a strict category, but it might not be um, the, the strictification that you want for the normal structure. Just the first example takes a little bit of effort. That's why a lot of people get confused and think that going to the skeleton is always the way to strictify. It's not, it's just good enough in practice if you want. Um, categories that arise in topology are very often strict on the nose, like our cobordism categories where uh, it's just juxtaposition, it's strict on the nose, this could happen as well, pretty cool. And um, endofactor categories are also strict, which is kind of the blueprint example of strict categories, if you want, because the kind of the, the, the proof of the strictification theorem, not the original proof by McLean. So um, this, the proof I have in mind is stolen from a book of Ettingoff, Gelaki, Nikšić, and Ostrich, which is linked in the description, it's freely available, really cool, cool book on monoidal categories is the strictification theorem works as follows. You kind of realize any category in a Grenada type fashion as a category of endofunctors on a certain category. And um, yeah, so the endofunctor categories are strict and that's how you do it basically. That's kind of the, 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 the gits of the proof. A really, really cool proof actually. As I said, link, uh, link to the free book is in the description. Anyway, this was a lot of waffle. So a lot of things to take in. So let me just uh, summarize. So strictification is this idea of getting rid of parentheses, which arises from just associativity in one dimension. So the classical associativity, the, um, what are they, I have the HGF equals HGF with two different bracketings, which actually then implies, um, that's a theorem, actually implies that all bracketings are the same. And kind of the, the point here of the corresponding coherent theorem for monoidal categories is that the, the, the diagrams, the commutative diagrams in the um, definition of a monoidal category implies that all diagrams commute. That's just a little bit painful to formulate. So I went with an equivalent formulation, the strictification theorem, which says every monoidal category is equivalent, monoidally equivalent to a strict monoidal category. So you can forget about parentheses. And the proof of the theorem um, kind of is a Grenada type proof. It realizes the category as a certain category of endofunctors, which is a pretty cool trick in the end. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video and I also hope to see you next time.